discuss this topic. Um, to my immediate left um, is Professor Deirdre Mulligan of the uh, Berkeley School of Information, faculty director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology, um, uh, has done an enormous amount of work uh, over the years on privacy and now looking at questions of, of artificial intelligence uh, and a dear colleague and friend. It's great to have you here. Um, uh, Alex Rosenblatt from uh, the Data and Society Research Institute um, is a technology ethnographer. Uh, she's the author of a uh, book called Uberland, How Algorithms Are Rewriting the Rules of Work, and we'll talk about that uh, with her. Um, to um, further down uh, the table uh, is Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, who's a fellow at uh, the Brookings Institution's Center for Technology Innovation and a contributor to Tech Tank. Um, she's been a leader uh, in telecom and internet policy for years, and it's great to have you here. And finally, um, uh, Alex Mina, I'm sorry, Mina Hanna uh, is the um, current chair of the IEEE USA Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems uh, Policy Committee. Uh, he comes uh, with an engineering background from Stanford, and uh, we're very happy to have him here. So just to, to frame the discussion a little bit, uh, to riff off the panel title, um, we've all somehow started to use the the term algorithms uh, in a very different light. Uh, as all of you, I think, know, if um, in the course of uh, your day already uh, you searched for an email uh, or tried to find someone's contact uh, or asked Google Maps how to get here from wherever you were, you used an algorithm. You probably didn't think very much of it. You probably didn't worry very much uh, uh, about it. Um, but somehow, <clears throat> um, we're, we're now at a point where um, we're looking at uh, these kinds of automated uh, decision-making uh, and categorization capabilities in a very different light. Um, we're recognizing that they're very powerful, um, but somewhat opaque. We're recognizing that they're pervasive, that they're going to be in healthcare and transportation and um, uh, armed conflict and the criminal justice system. Um, uh, we're recognizing that they're probably going to really contribute to the ongoing change in the um, structure of our economy and the way people work. Um, and we're also recognizing that they have pretty substantial uh, strategic, uh, economic, uh, uh, and military um, significance, and that uh, it seems like just about every country except China is worried that they're behind. Um, so, so we're paying new attention. Uh, uh, to these issues, and we have a great panel to talk about why it is that we're paying attention. And I want to, I want to start with Deirdre um, as an observer of um, technology often crashing into society and making a big fuss. The technology that is not you, um, <laughs> um, maybe both. Uh, maybe both. <laughs> um, uh, how did we get here? Why, why, why are we, we're, why are we at the point where we have uh, this sort of substantial power that's on the verge of being deployed in lots and lots of uh, context, and we feel worried about um, about about how that's going to go. Uh, so I think uh, maybe we could think about the government just as a particular example, and and why do we think this? Why do I think this is happening? So I, I, I you know, historically we think about. Um, procurement, right? We're going out and we're buying a new phone, we're updating the software um, for the back end of the agency, or we're engaged in policy making, right? Where we're going and we understand that we're developing um, policies that need levels of transparency and public participation and deliberation and expert reasoning. Um, before we make decisions. And one of the things about machine learning technology is that they embed lots of normative decisions, right? That they embed lots of policy choices. Yet the ways in which these things are coming in to um, work in government agencies, for example, and this is at the federal level, the state level, the local level, is often through procurement processes, right? Not through policy making processes. <laughs> So we get these bizarre things. Um, I'm sure many of you have followed um, all of the various debates and tumult around risk recidivism software. <coughs> and if you read the Solicitor General's brief that was asked for by the Supreme Court when the Loomis case was up on cert, it literally said 
Um, while the question of how gender is used in determining risk in an algorithmic system is clearly one of constitutional concern, this case isn't a good vehicle for reviewing it because the record hasn't established how gender is used. And one has to sit there and say, how did a system of justice adopt a piece of technology without understanding how it used gender? Right? And so I think part of the answer to that question is that these things are being viewed as, oh, we're going to go buy a new phone system, we're going to buy, we're not actually developing policy. And yet because of the complicated, right, if we were thinking about statistical models or mathematical models, this is an issue that administrative law is dealing with right now. There were hearings at the Supreme Court recently about Medicaid formulas, right? Um, that, that, but the question about how we deal with the policies embedded in these systems is one that we have not historically been thinking hard about because we've been thinking about them as kind of tools of implementation, not things that might actually be establishing policy in and of themselves. So, Nicole, thank you. Nicole Deirdre suggested that some of these systems have kind of snuck in uh, around the back door without going through a policy filter. Um, uh, do we have those policy filters? If we if we look a little harder uh, at our legal system, our the, the the norms we have in our in our uh, policy process, in our governance process, do we do we have what we need there? And it's just a question of of applying it, or do we have to do some new things? Right. No, thanks, Danny and Didra. Thank you for your comments, and all of you that are here, as well as the State of the Net organizers. I think that's a really good question, right? Because the question that always comes up is, are the guardrails in place for us to really look at how we identify and mitigate some of the biases, for example, that come out of algorithm, al algorithms and artificial intelligence systems? I think similar to when Danny and I met and we were talking about the privacy debate, we identified some of those guardrails when it came to privacy, like the uh, Equal Opportunity uh, uh, Employment Act, the Fair Credit Act, the House Fair Housing Act, et cetera. And I think those guardrails still exist today. Uh, the challenge is, much like what Deidre's talking about, we develop these computations and models outside of the box with regards to the policy implications. Um, and so when we have laws or regulations that are somewhat applicable to the external, external world and not necessarily the digital space, uh, we can make the leap that these can be applicable. We saw that in some of the cases. Um, Facebook had an algorithm that essentially was doing micro-targeted advertising, uh, allowed advertisers to exclude people based on housing and race and other protected categories. Immediately, there was a, a call from the ACLU and others to sort of uh, take that off the market. They did, right? But that was another case where those guardrails were there and whether or not technology companies actually look at those guardrails as meaning, meaningful um, application of those guardrails, for example, are things that we're still tackling and looking at. And that's, again, very much like the privacy debate. Um, these things exist, but whether or not the digital space actually fits within that box is a whole other question. You said privacy about four times. So I did. I, I, no, no, <laughs> you can't I, talk about this without talking about privacy. No, I'm sorry. Just, uh, no, I, you know, so I started talking about, like, government and do they understand the implications of the machine learning tools that they use and the sorts of policy decisions that could be embedded in the code. And I, you know, the, the use um, in the private sector by different, um, of, by different companies to advertise housing or financial products right. or jobs um, is another area, right? So in the Facebook instance, you could literally choose to target, right? right. And the law is very clear. But you can't do that. Right, but you can't do that. And that is something that as a company that's advertising, that's on you if you went and targeted. Now, however, what happens if you didn't intentionally target, but what happens is based on click-through rates and observations, the algorithm over time decides that the way in which it should target your ads to make money for the advertising platform is towards women or towards African Americans right. or away from either of those, right? Now you, as the company that went in and placed the ad, you have no control. You might have back-end visibility because you're getting a report about who's seeing your ads, but that targeting, right, is in this kind of interesting area right. in, in the law. But I think the question is, why would it be that someone would be using an advertising platform without understanding whether or not they could meet their obligations 
to provide fair access to. Yeah, and if I could, yeah, if I could just respond because I think Deirdre's right on the money when it comes to sort of this um, this muddled line between technologists' uh, perspective of the world as well as social scientists and policymakers. I think what you're talking about, Deirdre, which is an area of concern for me, is when we start seeing those uh, gender biases and racial biases have a disparate impact on those protected classes. So I do agree with you from a technical standpoint, it's hard to predict based on the input and output of the algorithmic design whether or not you're going to you know, create inequality. We saw that with Amazon and the gender bias that came out of their employment algorithm. But when women in that employment algorithm become underpaid or sort of put to the side in terms of employment opportunities or Uber drivers don't pick up people because they live in a certain neighborhood and they get redlined out of the digital marketplace, that's a disparate impact to me. And that's the that's something we need to actually deal with. So, so that suggests that we do have at least some of the basic policy tools right. we need. We have, some, we have some conceptual frameworks that we're used to applying in right. advertising and consumer interactions, and we have work to do there, but we're not at sea. Um, Alex, you've studied um, uh, No, No, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'll get to Mina. Um, uh, so Alex, in a, in a different area in which government does quite a lot of regulation, that is employment uh, relations, uh, you've, you've looked at what happens when the employee-employer or the contractee-contractor um, uh, relationship uh, is mediated by these algorithms, by, by processes that perhaps are somewhat opaque or at least produce results in a way that we're not used to seeing them, much like uh, some of these uh, targeting uh, techniques that we're talking about in, in, in the realm of advertising or, or, or even these criminal justice prediction systems. So, what, so, so how, is, how should we think about the changes that are happening in the employment relationship? What are they and, and what are the, do, I'll ask you the same question, do we have the right tools uh, to respond to them? I'm so fascinated that we've started with the discussion of do we have the policy guardrails in place? Because a lot of what I've studied as an ethnographer who interviewed Uber drivers across the US and Canada for four years and studied them online as well, is that what Uber has achieved as a symbol of digital disruption is an amazing feat of technology theater, where if you upend the conceptual framework you apply to how you evaluate a given system, it makes it really difficult to apply competing frameworks of regulation. So to give you a specific example, uh, there's a lot of debate over whether or not Uber drivers are properly classified as independent contractors. Uber billed them and other sharing economy advocates supported them as entrepreneurs who could be their own boss. And the research that I've done demonstrates that drivers actually do have a boss. It's an algorithmic one. And it encodes the rules of employment you know, through prompts and nudges and restrictions. So you can be your own boss, but if you don't follow the rules encoded in software, you risk being fired. The visibility of a boss is harder to suss out because it's an app telling you what to do, but it still <coughs> exists. And yet it might carve out some, some differences. At the same time, when Uber was challenged over whether or not drivers are truly independent contractors, their lawyers pivoted and said, well, actually, drivers are just consumers of our technology, just like passengers are. And in some ways, Uber has successfully imported a type of algorithmic management that we're familiar with as consumers of Facebook, for example, whose most famous product right now is the newsfeed, which is curated through algorithms. And the important part about that component is that technology companies have identified as exceptions to many of the rules we would otherwise apply to their competitors. So Facebook will argue that it's a technology company, not a media company. And Uber will argue it's not a transportation company, it's a technology company. And that technology identity is also part of a broader theater where you get to carve out exceptions to existing familiar cultural conceptions of what it means to work or what it means to advertise <laughs> or what it means to provide media and spread content. And that to me is the most interesting cultural narrative that sort of displaces a lot of these really focused concerns about how do you make sure that you know, advertising is done within the limits set by the Fair Housing Act, for example. Those are very good, strong, specific examples where a technology system has violated a given law. But 
what's also happening is sort of above that is a cultural shift in whether or not the conceptions we have about what work is or what consumption is or how we identify the core mission of a given company when it claims to be involved in multiple businesses, you know, also undermines any regulator's ability to apply rules in a stricter manner. So help us understand why that is. Uh, what you've said is that through the mediation of this algorithm, some mechanism that determines who gets which ride. My Uber driver today said that he doesn't use Lyft because it seems like it takes much longer. You have to have more um, longevity with Lyft to get, um, to get a, a reasonable number of rides. I have no idea if that's true. And I don't know if he has any idea whether that's true. And maybe that's a little bit what you're talking about, that, that the work rules, what we are used to talking about in traditional employment law, where, we, where we've regulators and courts have been able to scrutinize work rules, you know, when do you get a break? When do you, uh, do you get sick leave? All, all the sort of normal conditions of our employment are explicit. You're saying they're somehow hidden it sounds like. Is that, is that, is that the right way to understand uh, what you're saying? It's not just that the work rules are hidden exactly. Like they're evident after you examine it for some time. So a driver can choose to log in or log out at will, but once they're online, they have to comply with a lot of different behavioral standards. But because they're classified as independent contractors, drivers, like many others in the gig economy, don't start off with an employee handbook telling them what to do. They learn through like thousands of text messages and emails and in-app notifications over time how to comply with those rules. Hmm. Within that, you see an actual shift because there's two ways people typically find out about what the rules really are at work. There's like what's in writing and then there's like what your colleagues tell you are the real rules. Um, in an environment where drivers and workers in general become more disaggregated, there's not a concentrated social environment for the workplace. And so what's happening is that drivers in particular are forging those workplace and workplace cultures on other media platforms, so through Facebook groups and message boards. So there's this constantly, re there's a reconstitution of workplace organization, but that's, on, that's occurring on one level. On this other level, if Uber can successfully leverage a lot of the technology exceptionalism that Facebook and Google and others have benefited from to say the regular rules don't apply. It means they're bringing, they're importing that sort of exceptionalism to the work rules that we use to evaluate uh, what's happening. So drivers, for example, being classified as, in, as independent contractors means that a lot of, most of anti-discrimination laws around the workplace no longer apply either. And that's very interesting because, and I'm sorry, it always does this because there's so many different colliding logics. Um, you know, in the 80s, there were a series of lawsuits where, uh, you know, a, a company or let's say a department store might say, we only hire white female clerks because that's what our customers prefer, not because we're racist or we're sexist. And courts roundly rejected those arguments and said, you can't discriminate on behalf of your customers. But if drivers are classified as independent contractors and passengers are prompted to provide ratings to evaluate the quality of their service, and Uber then uses those ratings uh, to enforce rules amongst drivers, specifically to determine whether or not they can continue working or whether they should be fired. That means that passengers can now do on their own what companies might have been prohibited from doing on their behalf. So the system is set up in such a way that it masks bias. But so, now there's so many different loopholes <laughs> that it's hard to like pick which one you're going to right. go so, with. So I, I want to ask you one question and then um, um, uh, go to the next, um, to Mina. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying is that whether intentionally or not, um, for good reason or for bad, um, services like Uber have managed to distance themselves from the responsibilities that we normally place on that kind of economic actor and spread it out to to I don't know where, to some combination of the other customers of all of the drivers and some um, not very um, transparent decision-making system. Uh, do, do, do you have a sense, as you went around and talked to all these uh, Uber drivers, um, it's too bad they didn't have that, that you know, customer uh, prioritization system for you then, right? Um, uh, um, 
Do you, do you have a sense that 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 the drivers and the the regulators the are are adapting to this, or or is this or is this distance that's been created the opacity of the of the process uh, a barrier? I understand the legal barriers you're talking about, but I'm curious whether, notwithstanding the the legal barriers, um, is is this system all the people in it somehow reconstructing? knowledge in order to create the kind of accountability that, that you're suggesting has been avoided or are we stuck somewhere else? I think there's been a really significant maladaption, which is a type of adaption, but there's, there's, it plays out differently, right? It's never just a stakeholder arrangement between like drivers and the company, for example. Because Uber has become symbolic of so much of the disruption that the gig economy and digital culture brings, it has become a focus of much scrutiny because it affects so many different areas. So, for example, and then there's like different ways that breaks down. So, in challenging a conceptual framework, uh, let's say drivers are independent contractors and other companies could similarly simply manage their workforces with algorithms that enact the rules of employment. Um, does that make Uber also a giant price fixing? conspiracy because it sets the prices for all of these thousands, hundreds of thousands of independent contractors, and that how does that affect antitrust enforcement over a company like Uber? That has nothing to do pretty much with drivers and their experience of fairness or unfairness or the benefits or disadvantages of work. And yet, even when there's a clear sense of unfairness, specifically this often happens around earnings, so how much you get paid at the end of the day is, would be the major point of contention for drivers. Even when there is a remedy that regulators have, have provided, it, there may not be a direct sense of, oh, we won this battle. And to give you a specific example, um, the FTC brought action against Uber for recruiting drivers with exaggerated earnings claims. You might recall the broadly disseminated fact that drivers would earn you know, upwards of $90,000 a year. And that and many other claims about their earnings were widely advertised in recruitment ads. Uh, they, were pr they were found to be not true. Um, and four years later, actually just a couple of months ago, I saw drivers start to get checks because Uber settled with the FTC for $20 million over, over this claim. And so a couple of months ago, I'm sitting in Uber driver forums online where I spend every single day for years reading like every post and every screenshot that drivers would make in these areas. And they'd say, oh, I got this check. I don't remember signing up for this class action lawsuit. <laughs> and because Uber is the subject of so many legal disputes because of its many identity theatrics, you know, there's a real disconnect between even when you finally get a remedy, there, it, doesn't, it doesn't create a, a bond of advocacy, it doesn't demonstrate the efficacy of regulators, like there's a lack of explanatory culture around what it means to receive the fruit of the remedy. And I think that's an opportunity for regulators as well to sort of stake a greater claim in what they're doing, you know, to provide assistance and to remedy any, any wrong. Yeah. Well, I have to say, my hat's off to you for doing the, this kind of in-depth work to actually help us understand what life in that world is actually like. It's obviously going to be really important going forward. So, Mina, you've written about the challenge of, of what it takes to have our values reflected uh, in these different systems that we design. We've heard about several different uh, systems where there are questions about about what values are reflected, whether we can understand them, what sort of leverage we have to change them if, if necessary to hold them accountable. Um, uh, taking these, all these dif different examples together, um, how should we be organizing ourselves, would you say, to make sure that the values that we want to be reflected in these systems actually are? So I, I would say that it's a, I, I come from a uh, background where I'm trying to, or this is, I would say, this is my, my specific interest, uh, trying to bridge the silo or the group of people that are thinking about the philosophical, moral questions and ethical questions that should be governing certain aspects of, of the development and, and, and the widespread of emerging technologies and, and AI specifically. And I also have an interest in the policy and regulatory instruments. I'm not a lawyer, I come from a, a background of, uh, as an engineer. Um, but to me, because I'm involved in these two silos, I feel that it's, it's extremely important to find out um, how do we translate these moral questions or moral you know, questions of philosophical answers that you know, people who are in the ethics world think about you know, something like the trolley problem, for example, right? 
Um, and while this is a very interesting problem, and you might be able to find a very elegant answer, um, you know, from a from a perspective of philosopher and, and, and a moral ethicist, it's very difficult to translate to you know from that into what it would take to have you know a proper regulatory instrument in order to make sure that you know in, uh, that, that that you have some sort of way to remedy you know the course of harm or something like you know or 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 if there is you know whatever cases of abuses for example and things like that right so. Um, What's really interesting about the entire conversation and why we're really, and I think this is the very first question that you asked to Deirdre, is that why are we really talking about this now? And why are we thinking about the laws and the regulations and, and the, the instruments that we have in the law that can help us to uh, control and govern you know, the development of, of, of AI systems and autonomous systems you know, uh, also? The reason really is that there are some very interesting questions that are very novel and unique to AI. And one of them is, you know, a question that comes up in discussions like, well, the agency question, for example, right? That's, that's one. And we don't know really, um, and this is a subject of a lot of discussions, that, that what it means if you, if, if, you know, with the agency question, the, the repercussions on that and discussions on, you know, liability, liability law, for example, right, or intellectual property even, Right, because well, in intellectual property, you 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 know that you can have an autonomous system or AI that can create its own you know intellectual property. Then how do you how do you protect it, for example, right? Um, and then there's there's also you know context. There's a role for context that informs these sort of discussions. And this is the socioeconomic context, for example, right? So the the example of bias, for example, that that you that you guys talked about, um, and especially you, um, uh, Nicole. It's not very difficult to, to tie the bias of AI systems to the fact that, that in your society you have protected classes that do not have access or equitable access to, you know, to, to technology, right? And there are sort of, you know, sort of you know, bad, bad uh, uh, um, or harmful ways to, you know, in collecting data and labeling data and so on, and that causes, you know, bias in systems, right? So these sort of factors are important when considering how we're going to frame, frame the frameworks that, that will say, here are the ethical guidelines that should govern the development of AI. Um, so uh, I think this is, this is quite important to, to think about that. And it's also important, too, to think about, well, the regulatory instruments that you already have, right? So you also ask the question about, do we have regulatory instruments that we can leverage um, uh, to help us with, with this endeavor? And obviously, this is, you know, in other domains, we do have that. So in financial transactions and accounting, for example, you have, you have rules for transparency, right? Sarbanes Oxley, for example, this is, this is one example. You have Dot Frank and consumer protection, for instance, as well. And, and in, 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 the, in, the, in the law that you mentioned, the equal opportunity. Um, um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in credit scoring and so on, you have something I think, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to you know, fumble this up completely, but Regulation B, yeah. that's in the Equal, the Equal Opportunity Credit Act. You also have the Truth in Lending Act and so on. You have these sort of instruments that require lending institutions to abide by um, 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 well, rules of non-discrimination when they are lending or creating terms for, you know, for loans, where you are, where the lending institution will be subject, for example, to uh, um, um, class action, for example, and they will be they will be liable for uh, for remediation and so on. So it's kind it's kind of in between where you really have to think about the ethical questions and then what you already have in the law. Right. So one of the tools that uh, we often fall back on, particularly in the U.S. legal system, um, is uh, just uh, straightforward. Uh, tort or contractual liability. Um, uh, Google, if you, you may have seen, uh, at the end of last week, sometime last week, um, put out a very thoughtful paper um, uh, on AI governance. And since they took the trouble to uh, write it carefully, I'm going to pick on them now. Uh, uh, um, one of the, uh, and it's a very, very nice uh, discussion of a variety of different uh, technical measures that are important uh, in AI governance, such as interpretability and explainability, um, uh, broader uh, governance questions about the evolution of services, and, um, and in particular, uh, a discussion uh, towards the end of the paper uh, about liability frameworks. Um, and um, Google, in the paper, um, recommends what they call a cautious approach with respect to liability for AI systems, and quoting them, and I'm 
interested in the panel's reaction and perhaps the audience's reaction. Um, since the wrong frameworks might place unfair blame, stifle innovation, or even reduce safety, and they say any changes to the general liability framework should come only after thorough research establishing the failure of existing contract tort and other laws. And the question I'd have for the panel, I, perhaps starting with Deirdre, is um, if we're trying to understand how we should apply liability frameworks, um, are we supposed to, ought we to think about AI as a kind of a new category of system that we've never seen before and that we have to kind of think about from scratch? Or do we have models and experience, for example, from, from software liability, from all the licensing rules associated with software, uh, or from other kinds of services? Um, where do you think we start uh, on this question of, of liability? So I, I'm going to, I think, focus on particular areas where I've been looking at the adoption of machine learning tools, um, which is where we have professions, right? And there, so there are both liability rules, and then there's also kind of professional standards and often professional liability in addition to other kinds of liability. So I've been doing some empirical work most recently looking at how lawyers are adopting machine learning tools in the practice of law. But what I actually want to talk about right now is um, medicine, because, you know, we have the FDA regulates medical devices, and they've also been struggling with how to regulate things that are called clinical decision support systems, right? And these are supposed to be things that don't displace human judgment, but rather help us reason better, right? Help us use the benefits of machine learning. They see things that we don't. They can identify patterns in data or patterns in past activity that we can't. And I think at the end of the day, the hope for legislation, liability frameworks, whatever, should be aimed at improving outcomes, right? We want kind of the best results. And so for me, thinking about a liability framework, right, it would be one um, that promotes the benefits of human and machine intelligence, right? We would get inclusive intelligence instead of some sort of displacement. And at Berkeley, we like to think about inclusivity. Um, and so I think part of that can be about how we portion out liability, right? And, and one of the things that I think researchers have seen is that often we'll see technology constraining and limiting the discretion for human agency but not absorbing any of the potential blame or liability for failures. And that's problematic, right? To the extent that humans can't avoid the wrongful things, they shouldn't be bearing all of the responsibility for the bad that comes, right? But the question, particularly when we're thinking about things that are right, supposed to be helping us reason, for example, which is a lot of the, the potential benefits of machine learning technology. The question of how do we make sure that professionals are not kind of blindly deferring to automation, but rather are engaged with the outputs of these predictive systems as though they're a peer, right, as though they're text, not tool. And I think there, there are kind of two strategies. One is, you know, we, we actually want professionals to have some skin in the game, but this question about how we make sure that those systems are designed in a way that surfaces information about the data, the training of the data, the models, the analytic choices, how are null variables dealt with, what does the curve look like? What are the thresholds, right? That without that sort of information, we can't actually partner with our tools in a way that gives us good outputs, and therefore we shouldn't be left bearing all the responsibility. So there's both a role for, liabil a role for liability rules, but I also think that there's a really important opportunity for design. Um, and I don't think we should be looking for the machines to just explain to us right, don't worry, Danny, I'm doing what's good for you, let me give you an explanation, that what we should be designing is systems that actually um, allow us to contest them in real time, right, so that we can reason together. Because the technology needs to be learning from the humans. We actually have lots of tacit knowledge. We know way more than what the data records, right? Data has already been collected and it's just little bits of knowledge, right? It needs us to actually take on a life. Um, and so I really like this idea of contestability and thinking about systems that expose more of their reasoning and allow us to kind of tinker and, and tweak it so that we can reason together. Thanks. So 
So I think the, the suggestion that part of the responsibility generally, whether it's in the form of some formal legal liability or some, some other kind of expression of responsibility is partly based on professional standards that we have, but that, w that may need to evolve based on these new, um, uh, and the new circumstances. And, and liability, I mean, that means like we're waiting for the bad outcomes, where if we actually try to harness the capacity of design, we might actually be able to avoid some of the bad outcomes, right? right? And, well, and I think and that so that's, should be so our So I want to get the rest of the panel to react to this right. point in particular. The, the big uh, claim that's made, of course, about autonomous vehicles is, well, yeah, they'll, they may crash some, but right off the bat, they'll do better than the human driver. So we should be happy. Uh, um, the claim that I think will be made probably increasingly in the healthcare context, um, including by many of my colleagues at MIT, is you can train systems to read, for example, mammograms um, uh, 20 to 30 percent better than any given cohort of well-trained radiologists. So be happy. That's better. 20, you saved 20. You could have saved 20 to 30 percent of of the the lives of women who have these conditions. Be happy. Um, uh, is that is that the way we ought to think about it? Uh, just better than better than what we had done before. And I'll jump in. I think that, um, so I'm a sociologist, so when it comes to legal frameworks, I leave that to all the lawyers to actually talk about. Um, and I think going back to Deirdre's comment and your comment, Dan. You have Dan, two sociologists on You have two panel? sociologists, wow. and that's a, that's a one unique. <laughs> <laughs> sociologists are all using only one. But I, I think there's something to be said, though, about this disconnect between liability and the human condition, right? There's this one argument around, um, as a social scientist, I'm placed under strict scrutiny when it comes to IRB requirements when I'm actually dealing with human subjects. Um, I cannot interview people without some type of vehicle to say that I am not causing harm before I go into a community. Whereas what we're seeing in tech with technology is we're seeing a rush to market uh, because the information is proprietary in many respects, the marketplace is crowded, it is in the best interest of a technology company to build the best Uber application over Lyft, or it's in the best interest of a, a technology company to rush it out to market. With that, however, becomes these problems, right? with regards to the impact or the output or the disparate um, treatment um, or impact on protected classes in particular. And I think that's problematic because what happens is though technology companies, for example, in the case of bias, do not collect demographic information, the proxies of people's zip codes or the proxies or assumptions about their gender or what Michael Kearns has talked about, the inferential data that lays on top of each other. So I could be shopping for gifts for my kids on Walmart and I buy a particular gift and it now identifies me as a woman. Then that doll may be African American. So now it might identify me, identify me as an African American woman. Then the next thing you know, I'm getting you know ads for single mothers on predatory lending vehicles. Somehow the algorithm has become my boss <laughs> in determining my preferences. And I think that's where we then see companies come back, much like what Amazon did with the recognition um, uh, technology and come back and say, hey, this is wrong but the human condition has been affected. I mean, there are a variety of reasons. I personally put some of the fault to it, actually, Deirdre, to the fact that, you know, particularly in the case of racial bias, and I have an article on this, the lack of workforce diversity contributes to this because there are no triggers that tell people, hey, that meta-tagging of um, faces may result in a misidentification of African Americans as gorillas, which was the case in uh, Google. Google. Because there was nobody who provided a check and balance. Or there's no one to say that trade-off between fairness and accuracy and justice is actually not as important as us actually allowing somebody to get the right recommendation for a product or service. So I think, you know, to Deirdre's point, you're so correct. I call it the lack of white box thinking when it comes to algorithms and it comes to artificial intelligence systems, that we spend a lot of time on input-output and not enough time. And there's settled research. Sociologists for years have actually studied how people's zip codes are used to uh, redirect hiring resources. I would even say in the case of Alex's research, which I'm so intrigued by it, we got a chance to meet, it's, it's the algorithmic boss, but it's the algorithm that also determines what we found in an MIT study where drivers do not go. <laughs> And that has impacts, I think, where you don't have the combination of the technology and the human condition working, or people who are ex experiencing the human condition, working together to sort of avert what those might be. Alex. 
I think what you're discussing as well is some of the sensitive social implications that we have to be aware of in implementing algorithmic systems. Right. So that same Google uh, image processing algorithm that identified some black people as gorillas also identified some white people as whales. But one feeds into a racist trope, and one is kind of laughable. And so the issue isn't necessarily the accuracy of the algorithm. It's when you have a sensitive social implication, much like you might have a dispatching algorithm that distributes drivers to different neighborhoods and incentivizes drivers to go to different places, but there's a sensitive social implication to one. I would also just be <laughs> sensitive to those competing political incentives to demonstrate that your technology is of broad benefit to remedying mm -hmm. social harms. Because what I've seen in the ride hail world is that uh, Sorry, Lyft. What did you call the world? The ride hail world. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but what I've seen is that tech companies want to build off of the narrative that what they do is naturally progressive and provides immediate benefits because that's been the user experience of direct-to-consumer technology. And that could mean that you know, Lyft and Uber might say, well, we can't provide a minimum wage to drivers because it will undermine our efforts to provide equitable service in underserved neighborhoods. And so you get these competing logics. But I think one really prescient point that was raised earlier in the panel is what direct-to-consumer testing, sorry, not direct-to-consumer testing, but direct-to-consumer products does politically, because it might make it really difficult for a regulator or a politician to step in and say, well, actually, we need to slow down, or we need to evaluate the full impact here, or have we been sensitive enough to disparate impact? Because what happens is that consumers of services are leveraged and reimagined as political constituents. So when you might try it, for example, and restrict how many ride hail cars are on the road, uh, a company like Uber might display to you in New York City a de Blasio map showing no cars available as the result of an intervention by <coughs> a politician. And so that's just uh, something to be sensitive to in a discussion around the political impact of direct-to-consumer products. It means that you have direct access to consumers as constituents. All right, uh, Deirdre has one uh, quick intervention, and then we're going to go to your question. So um, uh, we have a microphone handler. Thank you. Deirdre, um, just so I think picking up on Alex's question, the, the importance of framing and the importance of language. And there's been a turn to ethics, which is um, a useful, important, right? We want to think about feminist ethics. We want to think about ethics of care. We want, right, in our decision making. Um, but we've had an absence of rights in this particular conversation, yet a lot of the harms that we've been talking about are harms that are about civil rights, human rights, workplace rights. And um, I think the question about the extent to which businesses need to be looking at the human rights impact of their technologies before they field them, is a very important one, and it's part of a broad international conversation. Um, and I think that uh, if we move fully away from the language of rights, we're going to undermine our ability to actually make sure that the values that we care about, which are not just differences in our ethical perspectives, but they're actually social and political commitments to human rights, um, are reflected in the tools that we develop. Thank you. We have a Danny, question. Danny. Oh, let me, let me, let me just you know what? I, I'm, I want to get to sure. a couple of questions, um, and, and you'll all have a chance to, to wrap up. Um, go ahead. Uh, it's Mark McCarthy with SIA. Can you stand up? Oh, sure. It's uh, Mark McCarthy with SIA and, and Georgetown. Great panel. Good discussion. Uh, I, I have a question about the discrimination laws, which you uh, indicated was a kind of framework that could help control some of the discriminatory impacts of algorithms. Um, but, of course, algorithms are, are everywhere, and they're growing into areas that Quick are not... Quick question. I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're, they're going into areas that are not covered by the discrimination laws. So should there be an expansion of discrimination laws to cover new areas of life or people who are not covered under them right now? And if so, which groups and which areas of life? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, and we're actually, I think this is a stage where we actually have to have this conversation around what that actually looks like. Um, we're not there yet, because clearly a lot of what we're actually seeing in some of the discrimination law actually goes beyond what was actually um, 
put structured under the Civil Rights Act because it's more behavioral. I mean, in the last few months, we've actually experienced living while black. That does not have any replica. It, it doesn't fall any, uh, under any civil rights law that we know of. It doesn't fall in the Civil Rights Act. It is a behavioral response to, I think, a buildup of where we are today when it comes to race and systematic discrimi discrimination. So I think to your point, I think having that conversation, we have not yet done a really good job, and I think to all the panelists who sort of heard us say this, with regulators and policymakers looking at existing statutes and regulations that apply to civil rights and human rights and applying them to the digital space in a very concrete, discrete way. And until we have that discussion, things that we talk about with regards to facial recognition and surveillance, predictive analytics, it's still going to be on the spiral of sort of, you know, where does this, where does the harm come in? And unfortunately, disadvantaged groups can't really pinpoint where they're being disadvantaged in the online space. And that's the part that becomes a lot more complicated when I cannot even tell you that I didn't get that loan because my digital profile had a lot to do with the decision making. And so I think that's where we have to actually go further on this. Uh, next, right up front here, we have a question and then in the back, Gary. Hi, thank you. Um, Gavin Logan, National Urban League. And you almost just took the words right out of my mouth when you brought into the civil rights impact. Because one of the things that I've been grappling with as we deal with these issues is that there seems to be a succinct difference between viewing algorithmic bias and data generally as a consumer issue versus a civil rights issue, right? Because you have the transactional issue. But my question would be generally, would it make sense or does it make sense to, to think that they can both coexist? Because most, most of the discussion is from a consumer's perspective, which is why I think a lot of the civil rights, the rights generally, gets left to the side. So beyond the consumer protection perspective where lots of, lots of this policy framework comes from, uh, how do we... I, I think we definitely need both, right? Like a lot of the things that people feel are unfair may not be, they may be experiences that are not, that people feel like they're being discriminated against in a way, but it might not be actionable under civil rights law, but it might actually be unfair. Mm -hmm. It may uh, um, uh, uh, come under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, in some, right? Because it, it may be some sort of profiling that's being used to make decisions about consumers, which isn't, doesn't require a trigger of a suspect class, right? So there, there may be ways in which these things come together. And I think one of the challenges with respect to some of the civil rights laws is that some of them only um, afford for actions against limited sets of actors, right? And so the difference between the Fair Housing Act and laws around employment, for example, and advertising, right, are, are different. And I think um, it's not just what the law protects against, but it also allow, it, the question of who it allows you to hold accountable. And I think these are really important questions, but we're gonna need consumer protection law, we're gonna need civil rights law, and I think, you know, like, to go back to the, the Google, right, the gorilla, that wasn't a win for Google. Right, um, and so I also think we need to actually harness the fact that many of the businesses that are developing these algorithms or developing these algorithmically driven platforms, their aim is not to undermine justice or to treat people unfairly if it's not in their economic advantage. But, right, and, and so in, it, there is some sweet spot where I think helping companies think through the implications of their technology is really important, and the human rights by design is a really important framework for doing that. One very quick final Sorry. question. Go ahead. Question about Thank you. Um, algorithmic bias. To at what stage before designing, for instance, any program, uh, could or should or is feasible? Uh, tech companies and government agencies or regulators could cooperate to minimize the damage caused uh, by those biases. Thank you. I, I I I might not be necessarily addressing the question, but what I wanted to talk about is because. We spoke about that earlier. Yes. 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 Uh, I'll keep that very brief. 
But uh, there is a very clear role for when we were talking a lot about the, the, the legal instruments that might exist or what we might need in order to govern, you know, these sort of uh, uh, aspects of AI. Now, what I would want to say is there is a very clear role for standards. And coming from the IEEE, IEEE is a, a very large standards organization. And in the global initiative for which I chair one of the committees that focus on policy, we are developing standards on algorithmic bias, for example. And there is a role for standards here that that can help organizations to think about you know the, the design thinking you know the, the systematic you know collection of data and labeling and so on and we're developing some some something like 14 standards algorithmic bias and, and and nudging and privacy and data handling and so on and so forth and out of that too because we were talking about the human rights approach too this is this is a very clear place where a human rights uh, based approach to ethics of AI is very is very important and very imperative, um, and it will have a very clear role to play. So IEEE, for example, the Global Initiative is creating the Ethically Aligned Design, which will be launched in March in Dubai, actually, the World Government Summit. And this is a very, it's very clear-cut, human rights-centric approach to defining what are the ethical frameworks and the guardrails that should guide the development of, uh, of AI. Good. Thank you, Mina. Just a shameless, I, you know, I, I hate to say plug. It. We have a paper coming out in Brookings on it. That's Good. I Look to for say. Nicole's paper. <laughs> Look for Mina's standards from the IEEE. Just one program note. Um, rush downstairs as soon as we uh, thank the panel to um, uh, Jim Langevin and Corey Thomas uh, for a fireside chat. They're starting at noon exactly. And uh, please join me in thanking the panel. This is exactly where we were debating on this paper. Like the extent to which you actually